So I remember this one summer, my dad took my brother and me camping in the Adirondacks, and we actually camped by Lake George. It was one of those just kind of classic summer vacations. We rented a boat, did some father-son fishing, and at night we, we built a fire, made s'mores, kind of told stories under the stars. Classic like bonding time, my father, my brother, and me. Uh, I was about 10 years old, and uh, my brother was 15. And I remember on the drive home from Lake George, we actually had a, our family had a banana yellow station wagon. You guys remember those, like the wood paneling? And uh, my dad stopped at a gas station to fill up the car for the drive home. And there was a vending machine selling Coca-Cola. And uh, my brother and me were like, hey dad, can you buy us a soda? And so my dad gave each of us two quarters. Can you believe that it was 50 cents to get a Coke in those days? And so we go up to it, my, my older brother says to me, he goes, hey, you got a small hand, stick your hand up the Coke machine. Because in those days you could actually do that. He goes, feel around, and you feel around, he goes, you feel a little button? And I was like, yeah, he goes, hit it. And I hit it, and <laughs> out comes a Coke can, okay? It was like jackpot, and he goes, do it again. <laughs> another one, <laughs> another one. And then again and again and again, and my brother and I swiped 15 cans of Coca-Cola. I even went, <laughs> got a sun-kissed orange, which made me hyper as a kid. And, uh, and we took all our loot, we hid in the back seat of the station wagon, dad fills the car, we take off. We're driving home for an hour and a half. And by this time, my brother and I, we're all like sugared up, you know, from drinking all our sodas. We're like burping and laughing. I'm hyper going off the wall. And my dad hears these cans rattling around the floor of the back seat. And he kind of, he's driving, he kind of looks in the rear view. He's like, he goes, you, you guys still have soda left? And he pulls over, he turns around, and he sees empty Coke cans all over the floor and realized there had been a heist. And he was like, Where did you, where'd you guys get these sodas? And my brother was like, uh, they were free? Now this is a moment of decision because my dad was a very patient man, but he was pissed, okay? You know, guys, I look back now and I think about like what I would have done because we were 90 miles away, a half an, an hour and a half away from that gas station headed home. And I realized as a dad, like, I like, man, you could have let it go, uh, could have blown it off, like, oh, boys will be boys. But my father had a different idea. He actually pulled a Yui, pulled a U-turn in our yellow station wagon and drove 90 miles back to the gas station, 90 minutes return trip. And we're like, dad, where, where are we going? He's like, we are going to make this right. And it was the longest ride of my life. He drove an hour and a half back. We pulled into the gas station. And my brother's like petrified. I'm like, Dad, I'm scared. And, and, and he's like, don't be scared. I'm going with you. And he marched my brother and me up to the gas station manager. He said, my boys, sir, have something to confess to you. And my brother's like, yes, sir, I'm sorry. We, we found these Coke. No, 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 don't find them. I'm sorry, we borrowed these Coke cans. No, no, no. He didn't find we stole these Coke cans. And I'm like, in a sun kiss, too. And the manager was kind of like, well, it's pretty creative. You know what? That's, that's all right. But my father said, no, it's not all right. We are here together to make this right. And he counted out $7.50 to cover our stolen stash. We walked back to the family roadster in total silence. My brother was just like, just ghost white because he was the criminal mastermind. He should have known better. I was 10. I just kind of started crying. And my father, before we got in the car, I never forget this. He, he grabbed us by the shoulders. He looked us in the eye and said, boys, don't ever forget what I'm about to tell you. Integrity is what you do when no one is watching. I won't always be with you, but God is always with you, and he's always watching. So I want you boys to act like men. Make him proud and make me proud. And then we piled into the family station wagon, drove home, and discussed our summer repayment plan, which involved mowing lawns and cutting grass. Now, that's crazy. I mean, that moment was 40 years ago. But like, I can see it so clearly because that that moment is kind of burned on my boyhood brain forever. Because my dad wasn't a perfect man, but he was a godly man. He understood the, the father heart of God, a father who loved his boys enough to discipline them to become men of integrity, honesty, strength, and honor. It's a gift to be mentored by a man who fears God and loves his family well, isn't it? Well, I'm so glad you're all here for this series, Man Up in which we are asking this question, what, what really makes a man, an authentic man in today's world? If you haven't noticed, there's a lot of confusion in our culture right now about what it means to be a man. 
Well, let me be clear. I'm not talking about gender or the differences between men and women. Man up is about the differences between boys and men, which has little to do with chronological age. Uh, reality is I've met 45-year-old men who still act like boys emotionally, spiritually. And I know 15-year-olds who act like men of integrity, courage, and sacrifice. So let me tell you what kind of inspired this series. Over the past couple years, God has been stirring up in your pastor a, a fresh passion for lifting up men in our church. So let me be clear, this series is meant to lift you up men. That's why we call it Man Up. It's not to tear anybody down. And ladies, we love you. You know we love empowering female leaders at this church, but I want you to know for the next couple weeks, I'm going to talk directly to the men in our community in a very real, maybe raw and honest way. I want you to kind of imagine we're sitting down around a campfire as guys sometimes do in the summer, and we're just talking openly. And ladies, you get to lean in and kind of eavesdrop and learn about the men in your life, your fathers, your sons, your husbands, your boyfriends, your brothers. But I'm going to be speaking mainly to men. So just, I can tell you this, I'm not going to make a million caveats, okay, or disclaimers. In fact, ladies, there's really only one rule for you. If you are right now sitting next to your husband or your boyfriend, do not go like this during the series, okay? No elbows, don't poke him in the ribs unless you want to shut him down and guarantees he never comes back, all right? Men, we can be shy. We need a little space to process on our own, all right? Well, today I want to talk about the five marks of a man comes from one of my summer reading books, great book that I'm reading this summer, by Brian Tome, called Five Marks of a Man. And Tome argues that there is a primal code that every great man in history has aggressively pursued. It's this journey to authentic biblical manhood. You actually see it all throughout God's Word. And so we're going to be looking at the Bible. And our anchor verse for this series, I put it in the mobile app. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 and 14 which gives this instruction. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, and let's say it together, act like men. Be strong, let all that you do be done in love. So in the Bible, acting like men, notice, is a high calling, it's a spiritual calling, but if you notice in our world, men are portrayed mostly as buffoons. Uh, Every sitcom dad is some variation of a stupid Homer Simpson, you know, like spineless Phil Dunphy, you know, on Modern Family. But if you look at this verse, you're going to see five marks of a man that I have personally witnessed in the lives of all the men I respect and love. And these are character traits I'm trying to teach my own son. Like I said, a boy doesn't automatically become a man when he turns 18 or 21. But what differentiates a man from a boy is the way he lives. Notice the Bible says first, it says, be watchful. It means a man has a a vision for his life. Be watchful whereas a boy lives day to day. Men plan and think and invest in a longer term godly vision for their life. Be watchful. It says stand firm in the faith. In other words, you're going to have to plant your feet somewhere because there's an avalanche of temptation that's going to come at you from our world trying to knock you off course. So the Bible says stand firm, man up. You got to stand up against the culture even when nobody else will. Boys tend to follow the crowd, right? They go with the flow, do whatever's easy, but real men aren't afraid to go against popular opinion. They have the courage, they have the cojones to take a minority position. Third thing the Bible says, act like man. Notice it doesn't say a man, it says it's men. Men is plural. In other words, real men are team players. If you're a boy, you want to be the MVP, the solo star, but guys, you were not created to be a lone wolf. Men need a wolf pack to actually run with a group of guys who are committed to Christ and to each other. And it says, be strong. Let all that you do, so this is about action language. Real men actually work hard. We take action. Men aren't afraid to sweat, put in effort. Boys have no problem wasting time playing video games, social media, while men value hard work and effort over time. And finally it says, let all that you do be done in what? In love. So love's about caring for other people. It's serving them. It's protecting them. Then the idea is this. Men are actually protectors, whereas boys often act like predators. They prey on females, they prey on those who are weaker, but men are actually protectors who are willing to lay down their life for their family and friends, just like Jesus did. Amen? Those are the five marks of authentic biblical masculinity, and I believe it is a spiritual calling that needs to be reclaimed, guys. In fact, let's just read this out loud together. Let's have all the men read this big, loud voice. Come on. (laughs) Big, loud voice, all the men at our campus's church online. Ready? Here we go. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. 
act like men. Be strong and let all that you do be done in love. Well, today I want to unpack really the first three marks of a man, and we're going to get to the others next week. So, by the way, this is a two-part message. It's not about toxic masculinity, like, oh, this amped up machismo, you know. I want to paint a picture for you of what authentic masculinity looks like from God's perspective, guys. The good father who created you. And I want to look at this today in the life of a man named Noah. How many of you have heard of Noah in the ark? Okay, quick show of hands. Some of you are like, Noah, is that, is that like the guy who got swallowed by the whale? Is that like, no, that's Jonah, okay? Noah's the guy with the big boat. Remember, remember him? Remember his wife? Joan of Arc, okay? All right, <laughs> let's get our story straight. Noah, I think, I, there's a lot of Noah I love. He was a man's man. And here's what the Bible says about him in Hebrews 11. It says, it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before. And by his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. Now, this is Hebrews 11. It's actually called God's Hall of Faith or kind of like a Hall of Fame. Like these are the men the Bible holds up as role models of authentic manhood before God. Noah lived thousands of years before Jesus Christ, and you can read his story in Genesis. It's pretty compelling. Think of it this way. Everyone's like, oh, Noah, he survived the flood. Actually, there were two big floods in his life. Right now, first in his first day, his world was flooded with evil. Men ignored God. They did wicked, violent things, and only Noah was left. And so God says, I'm going to send a literal flood to wipe the earth clean and start over with one man. And Noah, I choose you, bro. I pick you. Now, why did God pick Noah? Let's take a look at Noah's vision in Genesis chapter 6. It says this about him. Listen to how it describes him. Noah was a what? A righteous man. He was blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Notice the qualities here. The Bible says Noah was a righteous man. In other words, he lived his life in a way that pleased God. Secondly, it says he was blameless. He had integrity with people. And the reason Noah was righteous and blameless had to do with the way he walked. The Bible says Noah walked faithfully with God. He was on the same page that God was on. So listen up, men. Understand something. When you walk with God, understand he's standing with you. Noah was filled with faith and purpose and integrity. Now, understand. Hold on. Hold on. He wasn't perfect, okay? Read Genesis. Later in his life, the guy drinks too much wine. He gets drunk. He falls down in front of his family and loses his shorts, okay? Every dude makes mistakes. But walking by faith doesn't mean you're perfect. It means you live your life in a way that you're trying to please God. You live in a way that makes your Father in Heaven smile. You make God happy. Nothing pleases God more than seeing a man walking by faith. God is is real to you. You're walking with Him. He's actually leading you somewhere. And that's the first mark of a true man. Remember it says, be watchful. Men have a godly vision, whereas boys live day today. Men have this ability to say, you know what? This is where my life is going. This is where God's leading me long term. Boys don't do that, right? What do boys do? They, they, they just get up. They hope for the best. Do what's easiest in the day, right? I mean, I knew, I, boy, I, I was a boy all the way in my 20s. If I didn't want to do something hard like study for an exam or show up early for work, let's play Grand Theft Auto all day, you know, or, or Mario Kart or, or stream Netflix and chill. By the way, did you know By the age of 21, the average American male has played 10,000 hours of video games. By age 21, 10,000 hours. (laughs) That is literally the time investment necessary to become a master level expert in like the most highest level skills. 10,000 hours is what it took Mozart to perfect a concerto. 10,000 hours is what it took Steve Jobs to, to invent the concept of the iPhone. But we're playing video games, guys. We're like becoming expert levels and like drooling and like twiddling our thumbs, okay? Men say, I'm going to invest my time doing difficult things because God has a a grander vision for my life that I'm walking towards with Him. So guys, here's my question. Do you have a grander vision for your life, for your family? Now, vision doesn't have to be like, you know, inventing something world-changing like, you know, the iPhone or electric cars. By the way, according to his biography, Steve Jobs was a boy. Do you know that? An emotional adolescent. 
So is, I, I suspect Elon Musk is too. But you have to have a vision where you want to serve and add value to the lives of people around you. And you're like, I'm willing to actually sacrifice for it. So maybe your vision is to build a business, you know, that, that doesn't just earn you an honest living, but it honors God and employs other people. Or maybe your vision is to build a loving family. You're like, I want to, I want to kids. I want to raise kids, or I, I, I have a vision to start a ministry, a nonprofit. That's part of God's vision for my life. My, part of my vision is to be married to one woman my whole life, to love and launch both of my kids, and to pastor this one church for my whole life. That's, that's God's vision for me, what I'm investing in and walking towards. What's it for you? Can I just ask you guys, like, what would that be for you? Do you have a God-sized vision or a weenie-sized vision? Listen, it doesn't have to be complicated. Maybe, maybe the vision for you is, you know, I don't know another man in my family who made healthy choices. <laughs> maybe the vision is, I, I don't know another guy in my family who got married and stayed married to one woman and was faithful their whole life. I'm, go I'm going to be the first one, or, or, or I'm going to be the first one in my family who doesn't have an addiction, right, to alcohol or porn or, or pills. It says, Noah was a righteous man blameless among the people of his time, and he, and he walked faithfully with God. Are you walking with God? Yeah? Where is he leading you? What's his grander vision for your life? The book of Proverbs says this, where there is no vision, the people what? They perish. In my 20s, <clears throat> it took me a long time. I was a boy for a long time, even though I was past 21 years old. Around 25, I caught a vision for what a great marriage could look like. And I committed to Colleen, we're going to work towards that for better or worse. And guess what? We're going to be married 23 years this summer. Yeah, you can give God a praise for that. Love you, baby. <laughs> In my 30s, we had our first child, a girl, and then we had a boy. And together, we had a new vision for raising this, you know, authentic, loving family. And we had to change our priorities. And I had to put marriage and my family first. I actually changed priority orders. Instead of like being all about work, I was husband first, father second, and then pastor third. And then at 36 years old, God gave us a vision to launch a church called Liquid, right? For people who, who had given up on church, but maybe hadn't given up on God yet. And now it's grown to include all of you. And then, and then, and then we all lived happily ever after. <laughs> Not exactly, right? There's been a lot of highs, a lot of lows, wins, losses, joys, griefs. But I have loved every step in the adventure that walking with Jesus has led me on. I believe I'm fulfilling God's grander vision for my life. Like if you had backtracked 20 years and you go, told my 21-year-old self, hey, you're going to fly to Africa and, and drill clean water wells and, and you're going to host proms for special needs kids and, and you're going to work with talented teammates who are like brothers and sisters, I'd be like, you're nuts, man. Listen, man, God can give you a vision that is way beyond your current capacity, but it's not beyond his, amen? I'm not talking about a self-serving dream so you can, you know, pound your chest, oh, bigger, faster, stronger, king of the hills, a boys game. So you have to ask the question, is this vision about me or is it about God? And if your vision has serving God and others at the center, there's a good sign it's coming from a healthy place. I like how Mark Twain put it. He wrote, the two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. Yeah? If you want extraordinary life, you've got to identify God's purpose for you and think long-term. You can't go for the, the short-term buzz that a lot of boys go after, right? You know, Yo, yo ha, YOLO, you know, YOLO live once. <laughs> this is what guys typically say before they do something really stupid, okay? Like, I, YOLO, I'm going to have that third beer when you were good two beers ago. <laughs> YOLO, I'm going to charge that ski trip to my maxed-out credit card. <laughs> To boys, you only live once. It means I'm going to do whatever is most fun right now. <laughs> it's taking the path of least resistance. You, you go after the kicks and the giggles instead of pursuing a vision for the future that can last. Real men have a godly vision for their life, and then they work towards it aggressively. That, that's what made Noah unique. Let me tell you something. This guy, he had a lot of hate coming from his friends and his neighbors. In, in Noah's world... The number of people who are walking faithfully with God dwindled down to one, okay? It says in Genesis chapter 6, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, and that, this is so hard, listen, every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only what? Evil 
all the time. Um, anybody else watch the news and feel like we're living in the days of Noah, right? This is like evil 24-7. Mass shootings, gun violence, opioid epidemics, racial injustice, terrorism. Evil all the time. It says the Lord regretted that he'd made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So you understand that when God watches the news, you know what? It grieves him too. Everything that grieves you, the violence, the racism, the greed, the lying, the murder, God's heart is deeply troubled. One translation says it broke God's heart. So the Lord said, I got an idea. I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I've created, and with them the animals, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. Ever feel that way about your kids, man? I just, I, I just wish we had. <laughs> in Noah's day, the world was going to hell in a handbasket, and God is like heartsick. And as creator, he's the artist. He created all of it. He's like, you know what? I'm going to push control alt delete and I'm going to reboot the earth, wash it clean of sin and start over. But verse 8 says, listen to this, but Noah found what? Noah found, say it, favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah stood out in a corrupt culture. God was like, this dude is different. You know something about him? Noah was walking with God when nobody else around him was, which leads to the second mark of a man. Authentic men take a minority position while boys follow the crowd. You guys know this. Boys just want to fit in with the majority. Hey, do you want to go uh, to the movies? I don't know who's going to be there, right? But men are actually willing to stand up and stand out against the cultural tide. In Noah's world, there was uh, rampant sexual immorality, a lot of perversion, rampant violence, lying, killing, corruption. It's kind of like our culture today. But it says, Noah found favor, grace, blessing in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, he was marching out of step with the culture because he was marching to the beat of God's drum. And you're going to see this over and over in the Bible, guys. The men that God uses mightily are men who are willing to take a minority position. I think of Joseph, right? Think of Joseph who refused the sexual invitation of his boss's wife. Like he would have gotten a cover story in People Magazine today, okay, if he did that. He was thrown in prison for it. So understand, if you're a Christian man, you will be considered in the minority about the sexual choices that you make. Yeah? Like just get used to it. I realize in most crowds, I'm like, I'm the sexual minority. Almost nobody here shares my worldview. Or, or how about Moses, right, who stood up to the powers of Pharaoh? He leads God's people out of slavery in Egypt. If you're a man of God, you're going to be the minority and actually willing to speak truth to power and stand up to corrupt power structures. Or young David, before he was a king, listen, he was just a teenage boy. But he had the heart of a man slinging his stones to confront a giant. You will not find a godly man in all of Scripture who didn't at some point stand up to the values of his culture. Swim against the tide and suffer for it. Understand, boys don't like suffering. They just follow the crowd and blend in. But, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God says, you know what, Noah? Out of this whole rotten, stinking mess of a world, I'm just looking for one man. And Noah, I choose you. Why me? Because you're a weirdo. Noah was a weirdo. He was the maverick who refused to conform to his culture. And Noah, you choose to walk with me. And I know that's not popular. No Noah's purpose in life was to please God, not please his friends. Did you say that about yours? I remember in high school, <clears throat> back when everybody, uh, gosh, I think it was like junior year, sophomore year, junior year, everybody started going to parties on weekends. You guys know. And in New Jersey, let's be honest, it was mainly drinking beer and hooking up. And I didn't go. Um, but then I began playing sports. And so I wanted to hang out with my teammates, who usually got wasted on Fridays and Saturday nights. And so I'd go to these parties with them. And they're always like, oh, Lucas, you know, you want to drink? But my commitment to Christ was important to me. It wasn't walking perfectly, but Christ was still important to me. And so I'd be like, ah, oh, no thanks. You know, I'm not really, I don't really like to drink. And they, and they would actually taunt me. They'd be like, oh, church boy, what's the matter? You're going to get in trouble with your mommy and daddy, a little holy roller, you know? But I actually stood my ground. I said, listen, guys, I'm not drinking, but I will give you fools a ride home. You guys are tools. And uh, let me be the designated driver. This was actually before Uber. <laughs> and so I took <clears throat> a minority position in high school. And yeah, I lost some friends, but a lot of them came to respect that. That was not easy. There was a lot of pressure to cave. Some of you work in high-pressure environments. You know what I'm talking about, at work, at school. And you're under intense pressure to fit in. 
And you feel that squeezing because if you're a Christian, you will often be the odd man out. And men, you man up. You say, that's okay. I take a minority position. When you try to be Noah in a post-Christian culture, your faith will not be respected. You understand? You're going to get made fun of. You're going to get mocked. You're going to get attacked. Nowadays, you can get canceled, right, if you, you speak up about your faith. And this is one of the big ideas from Noah's life, men. If you walk with God, you will look odd to the world. Not because you're trying to be weird or different. But if you walk with God, you're just going to look odd to the rest of the world because you don't fit in. You actually stand out. You stand out at work because you don't fudge the numbers. You stand for integrity. You're going to stand out at school. You don't go along with the, you know, the cruel jokes or the, 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 the crude comments. You actually treat women and minorities and all people with love and respect they deserve because you follow Christ. I mean, can I just ask you a haunting question? Time out. Let's pretend this summer you were accused at work. Accused of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Oh, Mike, Mike is a Christian. Did you hear that? Yeah. Oh, she's a Jesus freak at school. <laughs> Here's my question. If you were accused of being a follower of Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Or would you be found innocent of all charges? Noah was crystal clear where he stood. He said, I walk in step with God. And because he took a minority position, God leaned in and said, Noah, psst, Noah, I'll tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to wipe this earth clean and start over but I'm going to save you and your family, and your family is going to repopulate the earth and begin again. Would God choose you if he was starting over from scratch today? If he said, I'm going to control, alt, delete, boop, boop. I'm going to start over with Nate. I'm going to start over with David. I pick you, Todd. Are you walking close enough to God that you'd hear his voice if he even spoke to you. Some of us can't even hear God's voice because we're just so, the noise of our culture just drowns out our Father's voice. But God speaks to men who are walking alongside him. He'll, he'll give you thoughts that you didn't think. He'll give you ideas you didn't have. And God spoke a clear command to Noah. Noah's like, what do you want me to do, Lord? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pick up an ax and I want you to get to work. I want you to build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out and then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. If I'm Noah, <laughs> I must have been like, God, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> like, like, understand, guys, this is before electricity. This is before chainsaws. This is before power tools. The poor guy had to swing an axe day after day, rah, gopher wood, cypress wood, day after day. No, had to chop down every tree by hand, strip it, plumb it, cut planks, figure out how do I hoist lumber in the air, basically build an oil tanker by hand. <laughs> That's the third mark of an authentic man. Men work hard while boys waste time. Work is about, guys, it's about taking action. It's not being the best, but saying, I'll do whatever's necessary to make God's vision for my life a reality. And understand, working hard doesn't always make sense or pay off right away. Fun fact, God told Noah to build a boat. This is about 100 miles away from the nearest ocean. He's never seen a boat before. Men, listen. Sometimes when God gets close enough to speak to you, he'll tell you to do something that doesn't seem significant at first. I mean, my first job, <laughs> before being a pastor, I was a, I, my first job was throwing papers on people's driveways. <laughs> you, know, you know that junky paper you used to throw out? That was me. <laughs> then I had to load grocery bags at the supermarket. My, my job trajectory wasn't epic, but God uses small steps of obedience to prepare you to do something big, bigger than you can think. In fact, the weirder the work, sometimes the bigger the breakthrough God's planning. <laughs> God says, there's going to be a worldwide flood. It's going to wipe everybody out. So I want you to start building a boat on dry land. Even though you've never seen a boat before, Noah, you've never even seen really rain, I want you to start chopping wood for your family. And God then gives them the measurements for the ark. And this is a detail easy to overlook, but watch this. It says, make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. 
Now, this is hard to picture in our minds, so I want you to imagine a boat the length of one and a half football fields. A boat as high as a four-story building. It was massive. In fact, let me show you a photo from the Ark Encounter in Kentucky, where they built a life-size, full-scale model of Noah's Ark according to these specs in the Bible. It's massive. It is huge. Noah's Ark, put it back up on the screen, it could fit 550 freight containers inside it. Big as a modern oil tanker, but give Noah credit, man. That guy was a builder, and as soon as God told him, I want you to start working, he said, I'm going to start chopping wood. Men, can I ask you this question? When was the last time you got your hands dirty actually building something? Like actual dirt under your fingernails? Your knuckles skin, your muscles sore from manual labor. I just be honest, and I include myself in this. I think as men, we've gotten a little bit soft. <laughs> Most of us live in air-conditioned homes, guilty. Sit in front of a screen all day doing emails, guilty. <laughs> Go to the gyms and, or get on Pelotons to exercise indoors. Because men today, we rarely do the physical labor required to build something epic like Noah did. By the way, that's why we do things like tough mutters. Any guys here ever done a mutter? Okay. I've done it a couple times. A lot of fun, actually. A tough mutter is this massive obstacle course and race for weekend warriors. Leave these pictures up on the screen. Men come and they test their strength. They carry tires up mountains, hang from ropes. They, they crawl on their belly under barbed wire, jump through mud pits, run through fire at the end. And tough mutters are actually pretty fun. Um, our liquid pastors, we ran one together a few years ago. It was actually a lot of fun team building. But you can see why that has a powerful appeal to modern men. I want to share with you a quote I came across. The chief creative officer of Tough Mudder said this, we don't really know if we're tough anymore. We don't have fist fights. We don't chop wood. Life has become convenient and easy. At Tough Mudder, we get a lot of what we call the fight club mail. This is the 25 to 40 year old guy in a white collar job who hasn't been scared, hasn't been wet and muddy and wants to test himself to see what he's made of, to prove that even though he's 38 and has a roller bag and a door on his minivan that closes by itself, he still has this inner badass. It's this visceral sense of accomplishment that handing in the Q2 report doesn't quite give you. <laughs> Isn't that funny, man? A classic marketing officer. Now, let me be clear about something. Some of the most manly men I know drive minivans with sliding doors, all right? So don't fall for the superficial stereotypes of like what a man is, okay? You don't have to chop wood. You don't have to drive a truck to be a manly man. Listen, you can drive an F-150 in black primer or a pink minivan, okay, with a, with, a, with a soccer sticker on it. None of that stuff defines you as a man in the eyes of God. Those are gender expectations. Those are cultural stereotypes. Personally, some of my very best male friends in life are artists and musicians. Guys who like to design and sing or paint, cook or garden. I, I've got very talented male friends who run construction companies. Some sell insurance, others sing for a living. But the common thread with all of them is that while boys are passive, we just let life come at us. Men are not. Men take intentional action. They work. They swing their axe. And it may be in an office. It may be in a kitchen. It may be in a classroom, a warehouse behind a spreadsheet, but they're not afraid to roll up their sleeves and get dirty, put in the work, exercise their muscles, physical, mental, creative, like Noah did. Men, can you imagine if God told you, I want you to build a boat as big as a football field by yourself from scratch. <laughs> that didn't just take brawn, that took brains. Check this out, little known Bible trivia. Remember what God said, make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. These measurements in Genesis are the exact ratio used to build modern oil tankers and cargo ships today. Noah's Ark was six times longer than it was wide because it's built for stability during storms at sea. Modern oil tankers have the exact same design ratio as Noah's Ark in Genesis. So understand, Noah embraced God's vision for him. He followed his directions. He put in the work and became the world's first master shipbuilder. Thousands of years before electrical engineering or modern manufacturing was invented. <laughs> like we celebrate Noah's genius today in hindsight, but the people in his day, man, they laughed at him. They mocked his work. They're like, this, is, this guy, who builds a boat in the middle of a desert? What, what a 
waste of time. You know how long the Bible says Noah worked on that thing, man? 120 years. Swinging that axe, chopping away, waiting on God. Noah worked 120 years before a drop of rain came. You know, all of guys tell me, well, Tim, I've been waiting on God a long time. It's been almost two months. <laughs> it's almost two years. I've been praying. I haven't seen a drop of rain yet. No sign of flood. Listen to me, men. That does not mean God is late in keeping his promise for your life. God had a plan for Noah's life. He has a custom plan for yours. It does not matter if you're single. It doesn't matter if you're divorced, you're starting over. You got to keep chopping. You cannot give up. Say, don't give up. Don't give up. Boys quit when they don't see instant results. But men aren't afraid to work hard and actually stick with it because it's through work that God's vision becomes reality. Guys, this church took my friends and me 15 years to birth and build. And I intend to invest another 15 years if the Lord lets me. I'm going to keep chopping wood. But when we first launched this church, I don't know where I heard this, but I wrote it down on a post-it note and I, I stuck it over my computer. I had it there for the first three years of the church. And it said, Tim, attempt only the things so big they're bound to fail unless God intervenes. Guys, don't dream small. Do you have a big God-sized vision for your life, big enough that it requires God to show up? Or can I just like ask, have you kind of weenied out and downsized it? I like how Brian Tome puts it. If you're like here today and you're like wondering what to do with your life, a first great step is to actually look, where is God already working? And then go be part of it. Like if you want to experience God, go where he's already moving and help out. So is there like a company or a ministry with great potential and a mission that God would applaud? Apply for a job there. Is somebody feeding the poor or the homeless? Go help them. Are there, are there fatherless boys in an underserved school? Mentor one of them. Is there a widow on your street? Cut her grass. And if there's any way you can take your unique skill set and serve others, watch this, and make money doing it, ooh, you go for it, man. You found the sweet spot. Noah had faith. He had a vision for his life. He took a minority position and he put in the work. In verse 22, I'll end here, it says simply, so Noah did, what's it say, church? Everything exactly as God had commanded him. How much did Noah do? Everything. <laughs> How did he do it? Exactly like God told him. Let me tell you how most guys do it. We do some of what God tells us to do. The easy part. We can start it. But the minute the part that comes that requires grit, we either say, this is getting a little bit too hard for me. Get some calluses here. And walk away or don't bother do it at all. But to walk by faith, it means that you are willing to complete what God tells you to do exactly as he's told you to do it. Even when it seems foolish at first. Guys, God's vision is fulfilled step by step over a long, 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 long time. This is not Amazon one-click overnight delivery next day on your doorstep. Men, men, the trouble is men today, we want God to reveal the second step before we even take the first. But guys, listen, until you take that first step of obedience, God will not reveal the next one. If you're like, I want more revelation from God in my life, Tim, guess what? You gotta obey what he's already told you to do. That's why so many men get stuck spiritually, spinning their tires. We only want to follow God to the point of, listen, precedence. I'll only follow him to the place where I've been before, but no farther. And we get afraid of doing what we've never done because it's unfamiliar territory, terra nova. So we miss out on new gifts from God, new anointings, new dreams that God wants to birth through you. Men, you've got to push past the fear of the unknown. Do not let your faith be reduced to the reality of your circumstances. Faith, true faith, is acting like God is telling the truth before you see the results. You want to write that one down. Take a picture. <laughs> Noah had faith. He took action even when he didn't see the results. He went out and he chopped down the first tree when there wasn't a cloud in the sky. In fact, this is kind of cool. I came across this in my research. According to Jewish tradition, Noah didn't actually start chopping wood right away. You know why? You know what his first step was? Jewish tradition says that because he had to work 120 years, Noah first had to plant trees. That's how far out he had to plan and think. 
He first had to till the soil, then plant the seeds, grow the saplings, prune them until they grew into full-grown trees, mature, then harvest the wood, plumb it up, saw planks, and then build a boat. A hundred and twenty years of hard work, pain, patience, and perseverance walking with God because that's what real men do. Amen? <laughs> You're like, what happens next? When's the flood? That's next week, guys. I'm out of time today. I told you it's a two-part message. So come back next week, but men, I would be remiss if I didn't call you to action today. Um, I'm actually a big believer that most men don't need another sermon. Uh, you don't need more singing to grow deeper in Christ. I believe most men actually need to work, to put in some time working shoulder to shoulder serving God alongside other Christian brothers. So I want to end by inviting all the men in our church to a special event on Saturday, June 25th. We are hosting a men's work day in barbecue at Liquid's Broadcast Campus in Parsippany. We actually put a little card in your program today. We'll put a link in the chat. It says on Saturday, June 25th, the manly men of Liquid are gathering at the Liquid Church Broadcast Campus in Parsippany for a work day. Pulling weeds, spreading mulch, painting stuff, pumping iron, spitting nails. <laughs> okay, seriously, just bring a pair of gloves. We will supply the rest, including a cornhole competition and barbecue pit at 12 noon. Guys, this is a men-only gathering. Ladies, no offense, we love you, but you just had the IF conference. And so this is a chance for the men of Liquid to gather from every campus tribe and spend a Saturday morning together, kind of rolling up our sleeves, getting dirty, and then chewing on barbecue brisket in a cornhole competition, which... Just warning you, it may get a little rowdy, okay? So uh, use this card to invite the men in your life. Fathers, bring your sons. If they're age 14 or older, invite a friend, bring a buddy. Men are not lone wolves. We need community. We need life-on-life -life friendship. So bring a pair of gloves. We'll supply the tools and food, and I'll see you on Saturday, June 25th from 9 to noon. Sound good? All right, let's pray together, church. Father, we receive as your sons an invitation to act like men. We have heard your word to be watchful, to stand firm in our faith, act like men and be strong, and everything we do be done in love. And so, Lord, I just pray a blessing right now over my brothers this summer. Lord, bless their work, bless their relationships, bless their families. May they find favor in your eyes as they walk faithfully with you like Noah did. May the men of this church just rise up, Jesus, and be found righteous in a crooked world. Holy Spirit, I ask you, fill us now with Jesus' strength, his courage, your integrity, to lead our families well and serve others in your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said together, amen. Thanks for watching the Liquid Church YouTube channel. Hey, don't stop here. I want to invite you to be part of our online community. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And share this with a friend. You know, everybody's welcome to join us. If you are blessed by this message, you can support our ministry by clicking the Give Now button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Christ. Thanks so much for watching. God bless.